Today we'll be talking about industrial agriculture and the whole idea of food regimes as a way of analyzing industrial agriculture. Going back to this uh, cartoon that I think is so interesting, this was the cartoon you recall, which was the, the, <clears throat> the way industrialists thought about agriculture somehow being brought into the growing industrial capitalist system. Didn't quite work out that way, but uh, capitalism certainly did take over, and that's what we'll talk about in the context of, re of food regime theory. These are three very important figures in the whole development of the theory of food regimes. First of all is Emanuel Wallerstein, a uh, famous, uh, famous sociologist in general, has written all sorts of different things, but one of the things that he's most famous for is the development of what's called the world systems analysis. In this world systems analysis, well, I'll get back to that in just a moment in the next, uh, actually in the next uh, slide. The two, other the two other people are Harriet Friedman and Phil McMichaels, two rural sociologists who came together a while back and initiated the idea of food regimes. Now a food regime in, <clears throat> in this context is a regime is something that's not absolutely stable. It's, a, it's the kind of thing that can vary all over the place, but it's relatively stable. That is, it comes from uh, some old ideas in sociology of the way things are, are <clears throat> organized is qualitatively speaking more or less the same for a long period of time even though there's a lot of dynamical changes that go on within the regime it can recognize as a regime itself and then all of a sudden there's a break and a sort of a new regime gets established and so this is the food regime theory and McMichaels and Friedman are, are usually credited with kind of the uh, original formulators of the idea proper background in the whole thing, let's talk about Wallerstein's uh, notion of the, <coughs> of, the, of the world system. Okay, and the, the Wallerstein's notion of the world system, you have two sectors. You have the center and you have the periphery. Now in this diagram it says the, the semi-periphery also, that's just sort of com to complicate things. I'm not going to talk about that really. I'm going to talk about the center and the periphery. Now the center is a place where political power is actually wielded in a, in a major way. The periphery has political power within the periphery. There's no question about it. There's all sorts of dynamical, dynamical things happening within the periphery, but the periphery is somehow beholden to the, to the center. The center is where the center of power is. The periphery is not so much. So think of the United States and Latin America. Uh, think of Europe and Africa. Think of the, 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 the in, in turn, talking in terms of today, okay? Now, the, the Wallerstein's theory extends, or seems to extend, or a lot of people think it extends way, way back in time. It's not just what's happening today. It's a, sort of a rule of the way socio-political organization seems to happen. That is, you usually have something that's recognizable as the collection of people and institutions that have the real political power, and then the collection of people and institutions that are, in some sense, subservient to, to that center. Sometimes the subservience takes a violent tone to it. Sometimes it uh, seems like it's so automatic that people think it's a natural way of being things. But anyway, that's the, that's the generalized theory. And it's, that's the theory within which the idea of food regime analysis kind of emerged. And then McMichaels laid out this idea uh, a while back, back in 1978, in this, in this sort of classic paper right now. And they're mainly talking about the modern system, okay? They're talking about the modern food and agricultural system. And according to them, we basically have had two regimes. We're living in the second, uh, but we had to basically have had two regimes. First of all, the regime since the beginning of industrial, industrialization uh, <coughs> up to the World Wars, one and two, and then subsequent to the World War I and World War II. The first regime clearly was dominated by, uh, by the British Empire. Uh, so the British Empire was the center, so to speak. Well, the, the Great Britain was the center, and then the empire, uh, which was mainly in what today we call the Third World, was the periphery, right, in, in Wallerstein's term. But what we've seen is we've seen a change since World War II because the immense destruction of World War II and the um, relatively untouched U.S. mainland, at least, from World War II, able to prosper so much, and uh, uh, economically speaking, where well, the United States came to kind of dominate the, the world situation. So we're now in the, re in the, in the second food regime, which is, dom which is a food regime where uh, we have the regular industrial 
post-World War II system that I've talked about already in another lecture, um, plus the Green Revolution, which brought that all to the third world. And we have a, we have a regime of food and agriculture, which is, seems to have been relatively constant since World War II. Now, there's, <clears throat> there is talk. Uh, among some circles of where the fact that we may be entering a third regime right now, or maybe we're even in a third regime. But uh, the, the modern, modern industrial agricultural system, according to some people, has run its course, is in crisis, and we need to have, and we are, generating new kind of agri uh, food and agricultural system. Now, may, that's, uh, uh, this is a very, very debatable point. I'm not about to make a, make a big deal out of it, but when you stop to think about China emerging as a major power, for example. China involved in all sorts of land grabbing, what people call land grabbing, or purchasing land all over the world, especially in the global south. Uh, that may signify a, a change in the regime. Also, in a more positive sense, the growth, the relatively rapid and impressive growth of the agroecological movement in the past 20 years suggests that so many people are questioning how that second regime of food and agricultural system is operating, that it seems like agroecology is coming into its own as a major force for transformation. Especially, I would say, in this, in this age of, uh, of climate change, where we now understand that so much of what we're facing in the climate change comes from that industrial agricultural model that we probably can't afford to continue that for much longer. So maybe, just maybe, we're entering a third regime. Let me, uh, let me read from one of Phil's uh, most recent papers. This was 2009 that he published this, as you can see right here. And in that thing, he says, food regime analysis emerged to explain the strategic role of agriculture and food in the construction of the world capitalist economy. It identifies stable periods of capital accumulation, those are the regimes, stable periods of capital accumulation associated with particular configurations of geopolitical power conditioned by forms of agricultural production and consumption relations within and across national spaces. Contradictory relations within food regimes produce crisis, transformation, and transition to successor regimes. <clears throat> and then he's talking about this particular article. He says, this genealogy, this article, this genealogy traces the development of food regime analysis in relation to historical and intellectual trends over the past two decades, arguing that food regime analysis underlies agricultural's foundation, foundational role in political economy ecology. And that's an important statement. I mean, he really is talking about uh, something very broad there and hold the whole idea of the food and agricultural system uh, being the major component of the way societies are organized. Now getting down to a slightly more mechanistic way that agriculture operates, David Goodman, uh, sociologist, economist from the University of California, Santa Cruz, he uh, laid out this scheme that I think is a really useful scheme for thinking about the way agriculture actually works. And he divided the agricultural enterprise into the inputs, the farming operation itself, and the outputs, as you can see in this little graph right here. So the inputs are things like machinery and seeds and pesticides and what have you. The farming operation is what you actually do on the farm. You plow the land, you sow the seeds, or, or whatever it is you do on that particular type of agricultural operation. And then the outputs are the seeds that you sell, the fruits that you sell, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Goodman's point is that when agriculture, when capitalists came, uh, uh, again, remember back to that old, uh, that old uh, photograph of the barn, which turned into the factory, okay, the point is that Capitalism as a system it tries to appropriate everything, right? So capitalism tried to penetrate into agriculture, and it's supposed to do that. It's not, that's not a surprise. It's not a, it's not a <clears throat> nor is it condemnation. It's just something that happens. And so Goodman analyzed how is it that capital penetrated into agriculture. And his point of view, and I think it's a useful point of view, is that capitalism operated slightly differently for inputs and outputs. In terms of inputs, a capitalism appropriated those inputs for itself. In terms of outputs, capitalism substituted different products for the outputs, okay? So the farmer needs to, uh, needs to get those the inputs that have been appropriated by capital, like tractors and seeds and pesticides, et cetera, 
and the farmer is obliged to sell effectively raw materials to people who make not peanuts, but peanut butter, uh, not corn, but high, 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 high fructose corn syrup, etc. So that's the basic idea of how capital penetrated into agriculture. So speaking of the various appropriations, we can categorize the, the appropriations. Of course, there are many and many ways to look at it, but from my point of view, there basically have been four appropriations, okay? Uh, first of all, there is uh, mechanization. Second of all, pest control. Third, fertilizer. And fourth, seeds. Let me say a little bit about each one of those things, uh, uh, a little more detail about each one of those appropriations. First of all, when we think of mechanization, we actually begin to think of how the energy evolution happened. This is the famous, uh, <clears throat> the famous gigantic steam engine at the Philadelphia 1876 uh, 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 Expo, the Centennial Expo. Um, is a remarkable machine, uh, as you can see, uh, a, certainly a humongous, gigantic machine, sort of uh, displaying the triumph of the Industrial Revolution and capitalism, etc. So now it's mainly in the mechanization of the harvest where this becomes ex exceedingly important early on. Uh, here you have the, the uh, early example of the McCormick Reaper, which was pulled by horses. Obviously, pulling by horses is uh, using energy from the horses, but in terms of appropriation by capitalists, I mean, there were capitalists that sold horses too, too. That's, that's true. But it's only when you came to having uh, tractors and then combines that you actually had the major, major appropriation by factories of this one input into the agricultural process. And this input became an essential input as labor costs became higher and higher and higher so that you really couldn't afford to hire, uh, <coughs> hire people for the harvest any longer. And where did that get us to? Well, that got us to this uh, amazing picture of these soybean harvesters in Brazil. Uh, this is as uh, this this photograph is now iconic. It's kind of taken as the the the, the symbol of the modern agricultural system, um, but this is sort of the end point of that mechanization mechanization appropriation. Uh, what's important about agriculture uh, here, from the point of the people uh, view of the people who make those big machines, of course, is that agriculture farmers are going to buy the machines, and that's where the profits are going to come from. Uh, the second appropriation is for pest control. Now, pests have always been a problem in agriculture. And as I've talked about in a previous lecture, what we, we had this uh, specific uh, appropriation of the pest control strategy in the post-World War, post, <coughs> post War II era to, to deal with an underconsumption crisis by the pesticide companies where we had advertisements like these are two other advertisements that I didn't show you in the last time I talked about this, but these emphasize that everybody should be using pesticides, okay, and everybody should be using pesticides even in the household. And to, <laughs> to uh, drive home the point, as you can see, the woman there, she's not really a housewife in the kitchen, but she's a soldier getting rid of the cockroaches in her kitchen with, the, with that um, machine gun that she's wielding. To <laughs> and the cockroaches, of course, are surrendering, as you can see. This version of the appropriation of the pest control system by the chemical industry was, was uh, documented in extensive detail in this book, uh, War and Nature, by Edmund Russell, uh, uh, historian Edmund Russell. And he's the one who looked at all the archival material to see what the pesticide companies were thinking at the end of World War II uh, when, they're, when they were facing this underconsumption under crisis. As I've said in the previous lecture, what we had uh, was, in, in, in this particular appropriation, what we had was um, a major ideological change so that farmers were convinced that they were not really stewards of the land. They, were not, uh, uh, they, they weren't just trying to take care of the land, take care of their farm, but that what they were doing is they were fighting an eternal enemy and they had to fight that enemy. They had to vanquish that enemy and the only way they could vanquish that enemy was with pesticides. Now, that led to something that <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about today, but it led to a thing called the pesticide treadmill. There are very specific biological reasons that pesticides actually don't work. They do not work in the long haul, all right? I mean, they work in the sense that you put a bug here and spray it with a pesticide here, it dies, okay? 
uh, <coughs> a lot of things die. <laughs> That's part of the problem. A lot of things die when you spray pesticides on them. But the thing is, the thing is, you sort of generate a process. You start spraying pesticides, things actually get worse, which means you have to spray more pesticides, which means things get even worse, and you have to spray more. This this uh, story has been told over and over again. Uh, frequently, what happens is crops are just abandoned because they uh, they can no longer deal with the pests, and those many of those pests are actually created by the very pesticides that are meant to destroy them. The third appropriation is fertilizer. Now, in this image right here, I'm showing you the actually a diagram from Albert Howard's uh, Albert Howard's work when he came back from India. One of the things that he discovered in India, as I noted in a previous lecture, he noted that the Indian farmers actually knew what they were doing. And when he studied what the Indian farmers were doing, he realized that it was relatively sophisticated. And this is his diagram of this uh, composting uh, system that he discovered in, in Indore, which is a, place, which is a town in, in, uh, in India. It's now known as the Indore method, a method of, uh, of composting. And the idea here is you take organic material, leaves, stems, kitchen waste, etc., things that are still uh, recognizable as the plant material that they were, and you take and you put it into a bin where it, and it's called a compost bin, where it begins the decomposition process. Now, anybody who's actually been a gardener, anyone who's done gardening, knows what happens if you take that material just fresh, take a bunch of leaves, for example, and put it on top of your garden. Well, what happens is the leaves <coughs> are is a great material for microbes to live on. So the microbes start building up on the leaves. Now, you don't normally think that's really good. Well, that is really good, having the microbes build up. However, there's a period of time there where the only thing that's really using the nutrients that are in those leaves are the microbes that are building up on them. And by the time you get to the harvest in your garden, you want to harvest your tomatoes or whatever, why the nutrients that were in the leaves are now in the bacteria that were decomposing the leaves, and they have not had time yet to themselves decay to release those nutrients into the soil for the tomatoes to pick them up, okay? So that's why we compost. You compost because you take that material, which is actually not good for the garden, and you convert it in a compost pile. That's where the bacteria decompose it to the point where it's ready to release its nutrients into the soil, okay? It's fairly, from a biological perspective, it's pretty obvious what's going on. And the details can become pretty complicated. And traditionally, people have, under, have, have, traditionally people have been composting for a long time. This indoor, indoor composting uh, procedure is just, is just one example. Now, the appropriation, of course, is from this kind of management to this kind of management. And quite honestly, it's easier, right? So this Indian farmer, he's taking little pellets of NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium fertilizer, and he's just throwing it around. Now, that's a hell of a lot easier than having to go through this whole process right here. So, uh, <clears throat> but the big thing is, everything in this process is owned by the farmer. Uh, everything in this pro process may seem like it's owned by the farmer, but not really. That white, those white pellets, they come from somewhere, and they're very expensive, and they're produced by the, pest, the, the fertilizer company that produces them. The fourth appropriation is uh, the seed stock. Now, normally what has happened in the history of agriculture, up until, up until the, the, the second food regime, up until the World Wars, uh, is that farmers take a, a portion of their produce and they save it to be the planting stock for next, the, uh, the next season of planting. Um, now we have a system where companies have appropriated the, 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 the input stock to the agricultural system by appropriating the seeds themselves. Now this started with the development of hybrids. And there's a, there's a particularly pernicious ideology associated with all of this, and it extends into the present day. The idea of a hybrid, uh, <clears throat> the kind of hybrids they produced in the, what's called the inbred hybrid model, and mainly in the US, Pioneer Seed Company was, was deeply involved, as was the US Department of Agriculture, in support of the Pioneer Seed, Department, Seed Company, not in support of the farmers. The idea was that this method would ensure that you could produce 
varieties that were really high yielding. Now it's an interesting, a very, very interesting historical, uh, hi historical story, okay? Because <clears throat> there's a, the, it begins with a kind of philosophy. The philosophy is that these hybrids will produce more. And that's based on an idea, uh, it's, it's called uh, overdominance, a genetic, a genetic idea. And that is if you have <clears throat> homozygous and homozygous, you put them together, you get heterozygous. That is you have um, a, a, a very monotonous gene here and a monotonous gene here, but they're different from one another. You put them together, that's a hybrid, and that produces more, okay? That's called overdominance, uh, or hybrid vigor is another thing that it's called. And so at the time that the program was developed, it was, it was widely believed that hybrid vigor was a rule of biology. Now, it turns out that, that, the, <laughs> that the biological reality, and this was known uh, this became known as the process was being built up and supported by the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, and, and to, the, to the great benefit of, the, of organizations like the Pioneer Seed Company. But what was well known and should have stopped the procedure entirely was that overdominance was an exception, not a rule. Now, in biology textbooks, we always give the exception because it's just kind of cool that if you take uh, this... Uh, homozygous and homozygous, that is monotonous, monotonous, and you put them together to make a heterozygous, that's better than either of the other two. Well, that does happen sometimes, but it's very, very, very rare. And it's especially rare in corn, which is where the, uh, where the idea was put into practice. Now, why was it actually pursued when at that point, any serious geneticist who knew anything about the literature understood that it was, that it was nonsense, okay? The thing is, when you produce these hybrids with the methods that they were using, if you take the hybrid seed now, you can take the seed and harvest it, and you can sell it or eat it, okay, that's fine. But when you replant it, it doesn't grow very well. It's called hybrid breakdown, okay? And so what that did was that enabled the, co that enabled the companies, that enabled them to expropriate the process of seed, uh, of, the, 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 of, of, of the planting material on the farm because the farmer could not save seed at that point. Now, where we are in the world today with our GMOs, uh, genetically modified organisms, it doesn't really matter very much. And since we now, uh, our legal system has, has uh, allowed that life can be patented, something that I think is, re requires a, a bit of rethinking and a bit of philosophical rethinking, in my opinion at least. Uh, but in the, in the age of GMOs, why, of course, there are legalities. and uh, no longer do we rely on hybrids to make the farmer not replant his or her seeds next year, but uh, we rely on lawyers with briefcases instead. So now it's time to talk about substitutionism. <coughs> and here there's really not much to say. I mean, people understand how this is happening. I mean, we began here with wool. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, we began here with cotton, which was spun locally, and then weaved, and then it was weaved on a, on a mill like this, so that this gentleman actually might, could be the farmer that was actually producing that cotton. And then we wound up with the, uh, the textile mill and in the Industrial Revolution. I mean, clearly the textile mill is a <coughs> substituted cloth for the cotton that was coming, off, coming out of the farm. There's no question about it. And then we have, uh, of course, uh, we don't eat corn. Does anybody eat corn? Well, cattle eat corn, that's true. But what do we get from corn? We get products from corn and more products and more products. We get fuel. We get substitutes for sugar. That is, we are a society world over that is based on the substitution of products, many of which are completely unhealthy for us. Uh, from the process of substituting uh, agricultural products with uh, alternatives that will make profits for the, the overall capitalist system. So effectively, we go, we go from the dream to the reality. Uh, and you can see the details of how that happened. Uh, it happened partially during the first regime, first food regime, but mainly during, during the second food regime uh, and that's where we are today. So let's go, we'll go back to the David Goodman, David Goodman's analysis. And we, if we can now ask questions about how that analysis plays itself out, 
uh, we asked, where does the money go? Uh, the money is going to, <clears throat> uh, obviously we know that there's money going to those who appropriated the inputs of agriculture and there's money that's going out from those who substituted uh, agriculture into the farm and out of the farm. And where is the dominant flow of the money going there? Well, if you look at the ones that are <clears throat> the, the, the appropriationists, those who appropriated the material, that money flows like that. If you look at the other end of the spectrum, and you see how the money is flowing to those who substituted product, that money is going like that. And so what you can see from this analysis is that the farmer is kind of squeezed between. And this is the fundamental feature of capitalist agriculture. The farmer pays an enormous amount of money for inputs to the farm. And the farmer doesn't get very much money for the output from the farm. Because the farmer has to use, or the, the, I would call it, say, the modern industrial farmer, Farmer has to use machinery, has to use pesticides, has to use fertilizer, and has to buy the seeds from the seed company. Okay, that's a lot of money that goes over in that direction, or in that direction, I guess. And then the farmer produces a bunch of peanuts, uh, <laughs> just metaphorically speaking, not just metaphorically speaking, produces a bunch of peanuts, sells the peanuts to who? To Skippy, who makes peanut butter, which sells at a big profit, but the the, the peanut butter maker is trying to buy the peanuts for as little as possible. The farmer is kind of squeezed between these inputs and outputs, not getting very much money from his output, not having to pay a lot of money from the input. And that's the fundamental structure of agriculture in the, on the industrial model. Uh, that happens, and that's, that's actually the model that works mainly in the developed world. So that's how, going back to Wallerstein's framework here, that's the way it seems to be operating, agricultural seems to be operating. Lots of other things are going on in the center, obviously, but just from the point of view of agriculture, that seems to be the way industrial, the industrial system is working in the core. What about the periphery uh, from Wallerstein's world system's point of view? This is a mural uh, in Mexico by the famous mur muralist Diego Rivera, is one of my favorite murals, as a matter of fact, that shows the Oh, the whole cycle of corn in the traditional sense. There's a lot of richness in this mural, uh, which I won't go into the details on, but you can sort of see there's a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, in the periphery, in the third world, the global south, you have a different kind of thing happening. And there's a tremendous amount of poverty there. And one of the analyses of that poverty is the analysis that there hasn't been development there. And there hasn't been development there. One reason there hasn't been is because their agriculture is so poor. Now, that has been said over and over and over again, okay? Starting with the post-World War II era when we invented the Green Revolution to supposedly solve this problem of poverty that stems from bad agriculture, uh, probably that's not really true. And probably it's pretty similar to David Goodman's analysis of the way the substitution and appropriation process has operated with the exception that the endpoints are slightly different. This seems to be more the way it's happening in the, in the periphery of the world. Yes, there has been appropriations, but there are appropriations that did not come mainly from the center. The inputs into agriculture are not from local seed companies, from local machinery companies, from local pesticide companies, or from local fertilizer companies. They're from the companies in the global south. And the products that are produced, whether it's cotton or, or, or maize or soybeans or whatever, those products are <clears throat> they're converted into other things for sure. But it's not the people in the periphery that are mainly benefiting from those. Once again, it's <clears throat> people outside of the periphery, mainly people in the center, or institutions in the center that are, uh, that are benefiting. So what you have is a sort of a classical framework uh, that corresponds with uh, Wallerstein's description of the core and periphery. And you can see sort of dynamically, you can see sort of mechanistically how the, mech how, what, what, what are the underlying reasons that that system has evolved. So let me end this video.
by re, re, revisiting that question that we brought up, that I brought up earlier. Uh, to what extent can we say, to what extent can we in, anticipate that perhaps we're entering a new food regime at the present time? And if so, will it be a new regime with just a new imperial power dominating everything? Or can we anticipate the kind of third regime where the agroecological revolution will actually become the motivating force?